you. Uh, but the possibility of votes in the Senate today regarding the government shutdown uh, keeps me here in Washington. Uh, in the short time that I have, I just wanted to make a few basic points. And the points that I wanted to make focus on what I do every day as a United States Senator and the efforts that I make in trying to improve life for the middle class and, and working families of our country. So what I want to say is that first, anyone in America who is concerned about the disastrous state of our economy, the collapse of our middle class, and the growing gap between the very rich and everyone else must be concerned about media. It is a media issue. Anyone who asks themselves why the United States is the only nation in the industrialized world that does not guarantee health care to all of its people as a right of citizenship must be concerned about media, health care, how it's reported, is a media issue, is a health care issue. Anyone who wonders why we continue to be involved in never-ending wars and larger and larger military budgets must be concerned about media and how those issues are reported or not reported. Anyone who worries about why we have not effectively begun to address the planetary crisis of global warming and the devastating impact that global warming is having now and will have in the future must be concerned about media and how that issue is reported to the American people. In other words, and these are just a few of the issues, for a democratic society to function well and to have serious debate about the most important issues facing its people, the citizenry have to be informed and they have to hear all points of view, not just the corporate perspective. Further, there must be an understanding that the impact of massive unemployment in our country or 50 million Americans not having any health insurance is almost, almost as important as the exploits of Charlie Sheen or Paris Hilton. In terms of media, the, import, the important reality we need to understand is that we are seeing more and more concentration of ownership, which means that a handful of huge media conglomerates now own and control what the American people see, what they hear, and what they read. And that obviously includes television networks, cable channels, book publishing companies, radio, and the internet. One third of America's independently owned television stations have vanished since 1975, as have more than two thirds of independently owned newspapers. The story for diversity of views and ownership on the radio is no better, it is even worse. For example, and this is an extraordinarily important issue, in terms of talk radio, and we have to be aware that millions and millions and millions of people every day are listening to talk radio. Approximately 90% of talk radio is now right-wing, including many that are extremely right-wing. Further, an entire major cable network is controlled by a right-wing billionaire whose job is to be a propaganda machine for the Republican Party. With the flow of information resting in so few hands, it is no wonder that on issue after issue, we are only getting one side of the story, and that is the corporate position. And let me just give you, as a United States Senator, just a few examples of what I run into every day on some of the most important concerns of the American people. We are hearing a whole lot about Social Security. Tonight, when you turn on your TV, you're going to hear some commentator, some politician, some pundit telling you that Social Security 
is going bankrupt. Millions of people now believe that, especially younger people. But the reality is that Social Security is not going bankrupt. The reality is that it has a $2.6 trillion surplus, can pay out every nickel owed to every eligible American for the next 26 years. And I know this will amaze you because you don't hear it so often. It has not contributed one penny to the deficit. Massive amounts of misinformation regarding Social Security. Right now, as all of you know, there's a great debate taking place in Washington having to do with the possibility of a government shutdown, and that is deficit reduction. Question, is there another way to move toward deficit reduction other than slashing programs for the middle class, for children, for the elderly, for the sick and the poor? The debate that I hear every day in the mass media is, well, do you want to cut 50 billion? Do you want to cut 80 billion? Do you want to cut 100 billion? How many children do you want to throw off of Head Start? How many community health centers do you want to close down? You do not hear much about, virtually nothing about, asking the wealthiest people in this country to pay a little bit more in taxes or the need to end tax loopholes, which allow huge corporations making billions in profits to pay nothing in taxes. In other words, on this huge issue that the whole country is focused on, virtually the only area that we are allowed to discuss is what we cut, not the issue of asking the wealthiest people in this country who are doing phenomenally well to contribute a little bit more so we don't have to do away with nutrition programs for low-income children. Then there's another issue out there. And I am a member of both the Environmental Committee and the Energy Committee. And that is the debate about global warming. Virtually the entire scientific community agrees that global warming is real, and almost all of the scientists who have studied this issue believe that man-made activities are largely responsible for global warming. And yet, when you turn on the TV or you listen to the radio or the newspapers, the message that we get is there is a vigorous debate. We're not quite sure. And that is an issue also that we have got to be dealing with. I have fought very, very hard in terms of providing health care to all of our people, yet what I see every day, what I hear every day in the media is that we have the best health care system in the world. How often do we hear information about the fact that we are today spending almost twice as much per person on health care as do the people of any other industrialized nation, and yet we have 50 million Americans who have no health insurance today at all, and some 45,000 Americans will die this year because they don't get to a doctor when they should. In other words, if you are serious about understanding where we are for health care, how different we are from every other major country, health care becomes a media issue. Now, let me just also say that the story and what's happening today is certainly not all bad. Yes, big media is moving away from the issues that matter on the ground to ordinary people, and we must be vigilant in trying to reverse that process. But at the same time, we should take a great deal of pride in terms of exciting grassroots internet news sources, blogs and campaigns that are starting to fill that vacuum. We should be very proud of the host of progressive outlets and websites that have sprung up in recent years. Bright and articulate people across the country, many of whom have gathered in this room today, have taken it upon themselves to create a new generation of news on television, on radio, and in print, and on the internet. And I just want to thank all of them for what they are doing. You are doing an extraordinary job. Bottom line, and let me conclude on this note, 
that for all of us who understand what democracy is about, who love our country, who believe that the American people are entitled to hear all sides of the story, not just the perspective from millionaires and billionaires who largely own the media. We understand that we've got a whole lot of work in front of us. But I know that given the job that many of you are doing, we're going to continue the fight. We are going to continue to grow. We're going to continue to allow the American people to hear all points of view. And I just want to thank all of you for the efforts that you have made. Thank you very much. Senator Bernie Sanders. Absolutely, we will, for those of you who can own, don't hear uh, that, uh, we will be posting that to our site uh, as soon as we can get it down to a manageable size. So uh, uh, you can look for that online at freepress.net. Uh, speaking of the independent media, uh, I hope we can have a, a round of applause for Free Speech TV. Free Speech TV has been here all weekend. They've broadcast all the plenaries. They've been broadcasting sessions. They've got a roving camera. They've been doing live interviews uh, on the plaza level, and we are so grateful to have them and their whole crew here. I uh, also want to thank uh, the folks at Democracy Now! who brought the show here on Friday. Tr truly an amazing model, and uh, they'll also be uh, capturing footage all weekend, so be sure to tune in during the week to see more from the conference, maybe something you missed. Uh, and uh, you know, just in general, I want to thank all of the independent media makers are here. I mean, so many independent media outlets were so far ahead of the mainstream, of course, uh, in covering this movement, in covering these issues. Places like The Nation Magazine and In These Times and Mother Jones were talking about these things long before uh, the mainstream was paying attention, and that's true on so many issues. So we're so grateful uh, that they're here with us and that they've spent so much time covering the issues that matter. Uh, I have a few other words of thanks uh, for folks who've helped put on this event this weekend. I want to especially thank the, the staff and crew uh, here at the Boston Seaport uh, and at the hotel across the street. Uh, I want to thank our AV crew who have been uh, running around uh, all weekend, uh, especially Rick Tremblay. They've been very helpful. Uh, I, I get to see a lot of this conference from backstage, uh, and so I know how important the work of our stage managing crew, Tag Evers, uh, who has actually managed the stage here at all but one NCMR. Uh, and I won't tell you which one he missed, but uh, the stage was a mess that time. So. Uh, we're, we're so grateful to have him and uh, Sean Michael Dargan, who uh, has been helping him out all weekend. Um, uh, we've also, of course, in addition to those great independent media outlets, we have been streaming online uh, at Free Speech TV and at freepress.net all weekend. And Chris Thomas is sitting at a, a small desk in the back there, but he has kept those streams up and running throughout the conference. So I want to appreciate Chris. And, and just to point out a couple other things, there has been a whole crew of media makers from community media centers and public access channels. They have organized themselves to actually cover every single session here at the conference. So uh, Rob McCausland has been coordinating that effort and they're going to be arranging to get all of the content uh, online so it can be shared and so that public access channels all across the country, PEG channels, will be able to air content from this conference. So we are deeply indebted to Rob McCausland. Uh, just a few more words of thanks. Uh, we had more than 60 volunteers uh, who turned out. We really couldn't have done this without them. They dealt with registration. They dealt with all sorts of problems, made sure the rooms were running, uh, and uh, they all did it on their own time dedicated here. So thank you, volunteers. And uh, we had a great local host committee. Uh, we met them on Friday. I'm not going to name them now, but they really helped bring Boston to this conference. We had a huge turnout from the local community, a lot of new people who had never been to a media reform conference. So I appreciate all their hard work. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, I do want to thank uh, my incredible staff here at Free Press. Uh, I really do believe that pound for pound, they're the best staff out there. And uh, if they are here with us, I hope maybe I'll convince them to stand up uh, and get a little bit of appreciation. Uh, 
there's a few of them that have been sitting in a windowless room this whole time, uh, making sure the website stays online. And uh, so I want to appreciate those guys. I want to appreciate our track chairs, Josh Stearns, Joel Kelsey, Candace Clement, Misty perez Trutson, and Josh Levy, who put together the whole program uh, here this weekend and have been working on it throughout the year. Uh, I want to thank Kimberly Longy. Uh, she's, she's our chief operating officer. She's the one who does all the things so I can come and stand up here and make jokes. Uh, she uh, keeps everything running, including registration and all the logistics here, and uh, keeps our finances in good shape. And she doesn't get the chance to come front and center. So I want to especially thank Kimberly for building Free Press into the organization that it is today. Uh, my, last, my last words of thanks are to our two incredible conference managers. They spent almost a year putting this event together. Mary Alice Krim handled the program and all the planning. Kate McKenney took care of the logistics and she has been managing everything backstage, making sure all of our trains run while we're here. So last but very much not least, I'd really like to get that biggest cheer of all for Mary Alice Krim and Kate McKenney. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm now I want to introduce our first speaker here today. Uh, she is Kim Gandy, the Vice President and General Counsel at the Feminist Majority and the Feminist Majority Foundation. Previously, she served as the President of the National Organization for Women and Chair of the NOW Foundation and Political Action Committees. She was one of the lead organizers of the 2004 March for Women's Lives, where 1.2 million activists gathered for one of the largest and most diverse grassroots mobilizations in our nation's history. She has been a longtime member of the Free Press Board of Directors, who I uh, did not mention earlier, but would very much like to mention now for all of their support. Uh, and just recently, uh, she has agreed to take over as the new chair of the Board of Free Press. So please welcome Kim Gandy. Thank you. Oh, he's tall, my goodness. It really is such an honor for me to continue serving Free Press in this new role with a really amazingly dedicated and committed and talented board of directors, uh, many of whom are, are here with us. Thank you to all of you who are serving with me on the board. We've been so fortunate to have had the great leadership of Josh Silver and of course his co-founder Bob McChesney these last nine years. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Kimberly Longy. I heard that she was just acknowledged, but her extraordinary guidance has been so important to the development of this organization. And now we have terrific new leadership from Craig Aaron. Isn't he wonderful? Craig, can you hear us back there? He's just wonderful. When I did my first media campaign in 1976, we challenged literally dozens of radio and television licenses throughout the state of Louisiana because of their exclusion of women. And at that time, I couldn't even imagine personal computers in 1978, much less the internet. And we really had no idea what the challenges were that would come to us on for, for media and for democracy. They've been so different than the challenges we thought we were going to have in the 1970s. But one thing I do know is that whatever changes lie ahead for us, I know that free press with all of you in this room, all the organizations that are represented in this room, the, the diverse and independent media that we have here, not only covering us on free speech TV, but throughout the country women and men who care about democracy are standing up for free, diverse, and independent media. And I know that we are ready for the challenge. All of you in this room are gonna be leading that fight and we're gonna be right there with you. I now, <laughs> yeah, give yourselves a hand. You're, you're in charge now. And now I have the honor to introduce to you our next speaker. Rinku Sen is the President and Executive Director of the Applied Research Center, ARC, and publisher of Colorlines.com. You have her very impressive bio in your book, so I'm not going to read 
her bio to you. You can read that for yourself. And when you do, you will see why she has been a leading figure in the racial justice movement for the last 20 years. But I'm going to tell you a couple of things that aren't in her bio that say, I think, more about who she is and why we're so excited to have her here. In 1996, that's 15 years ago, and you're going to look at her and say, well, she must have been 11 when they did this. Fifteen years ago, Ms. Magazine named her one of the 21 feminists to watch in the 21st century. She says she's still working on that because she was assigned an entire century that she, <laughs> that she had to do. And she was also recently named by Utney Reader as one of the 50 visionaries in social justice and community organizing. Please join me in welcoming the amazing Rinku Sen. Hi, everybody. Can you all see me? I'm a tiny person, so podiums and I don't get along very well. Um, I am so, so happy to be here. It's a huge honor to be introduced by Kim Gandhi, a woman with uh, an enormous history and uh, a great deal of leadership in social justice and um, all of you look wonderful, uh, although I can barely see you because of the lights, but I can, I can feel your energy, your, your lovely energy. Um, I wanted to start by telling you a quick story. This actually happened uh, just at the turn of this century, this century that I'm um, supposedly responsible for along with, along with all of you. I was, uh, it was New Year's Eve 1999, or New Year's Eve going into 2000, coming into this century, and I was in Novato, California. I had been, I had spent a week at a friend's house, house sitting while, while she was away, and um, to be honest, I was, I was nursing a big emotional hurt, and uh, so I had spent a week kind of by myself reflecting and, you know, getting in touch with myself and all of that. And, and at the end of the week, I decided I would go to a New Year's Eve party, and I needed to cook something to take with me to the party. And because I had been in this uh, very open emotional state, when I went to the grocery store, I was still kind of raw, and I, I had decided I wanted to make a pot roast for this party. So I was in the meat section, looking, looking at the cuts of beef and, and looking for the right pot roast. And right next to me were two people the, the city of Novato is a fairly white city in Northern California, uh, more of a town really, small city. And uh, so I'm in this grocery store that is where the workers are of color, but the people shopping there are largely white. And I'm standing right next to two people, two middle-aged white people, a woman and a man. They might have been 50, 55. And I was overhearing their conversation because I was standing right next to them. There was, there was no barrier between us. Um, uh, and so I hear them beginning to talk about the union in that grocery store which had just been decertified. And they were really upset about this and they were complaining to each other about how all the workers would be abandoned now and they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to protect themselves. And, and, you know, I was trained first as a community organizer and then as a reporter, and I think those have to be the two nosiest professions in the world. So, um, you know, throughout my entire life, I had been, my adult life, I had been taught to just butt in and ask questions and get people to talk to me about things that are really not any of my business. And so I felt perfectly fine turning to these two people and saying, excuse me, I couldn't help overhearing your conversation and I've worked with unions for a long time and I just wondered which union was it that, was, uh, that used to be in this grocery store and that now lo no longer is? Uh, you know, what local was it? What union was it? And neither one of them answered me, but the woman looked me right in my face, right in my eye, with a, a blank face herself, no affect, and she, she didn't answer my question, but she said instead, oh, but those blacks and uh, immigrants now, they can just get all the welfare that they want. And my first reaction was shock. Uh, did she really just say that to me? And my second reaction uh, horribly was humiliation. You know, I thought, oh, I shouldn't have butt into their conversation. This is what you get for poking your nose into 
places where you don't exi uh, you're, you're not belonging. And my third reaction was total rage. I, I just couldn't believe that this person who had, um, who, with whom I felt such empathy, you know, I felt such so bad that this union had been, had been gotten rid of in, in, um, in a place that she cared about. I, I was enraged that she had the impression that I was part of a group of people that was actually taking advantage of her. And it was a long time before I could feel any compassion for her. But eventually I did because I realized that woman and I, we need to be in the same movement. We agree that unions are a good thing. We agree that people who work hard for their employer should not be abused by their employer, that they should be able to have some control over their workplace. Uh, we agree probably on a whole host of other things, but she had decided that I didn't belong in her community. If we have a circle around us and inside the circle are people who are like us and outside the circle are people who are not like us, I was not in her circle. And she, uh, I wanted her to be in my circle, but she wasn't showing me that she wanted, wanted to be there. And she had decided that I was a person who didn't belong and who was taking advantage of her. And frankly, Ronald Reagan had convinced her of that while he started the process that eventually led to the decertification of that very union uh, that she was now missing. The job of the media in this country is to explain me and that woman to each other. To explain us to each other So that the great irony that by the year 2000, none of us had the welfare that we needed, and by 2011, when we've just had the worst recession in 50 years, we don't have the safety net that we need. Because Ronald Reagan convinced Americans that uh, there was something called, there was a person called the welfare queen who was black and who took all those welfare benefits and used it to buy herself fur coats and Cadillacs. Now, that means that the progressive media and that the, the progressive movement needs to be able to address race explicitly and straightforwardly and in a way that puts the entire analysis together. When we have liberal silence on racial questions, the only people talking to that lady who I met in the Safeway store are conservatives. And the way they define racism is that it's always individual, that it's always intentional, and that it's always obvious. And you know what? We passed laws in this country in the 1960s that are supposed to do away with that kind of racism. Therefore, it must no longer exist. Therefore, colorblindness must have been the solution to racial discrimination, and therefore we must be done with all of that. And so if you are a person who needs a safety net, then that must be your fault. That is how conservatives define the race debate today. And that is what helps them to convince Americans that the sky is really green and the sea is really a desert and healthcare reform is really evil. Uh, it isn't just about having a class analysis and economic analysis and analysis of the way in, in which our democracy is broken. All of those things have at their center uh, the inclusion of people of color, the inclusion of racial justice as part of the broad social justice agenda. If we don't have that idea about what we're doing here, then uh, Congress people are always going to be able to, with impunity, pull up an acronym that says the state children's health insurance program really stands for socialized Clinton-esque health care for illegals and their parents. That actually happened. That was a sign that uh, Steve King held up in, in the halls of Congress. Now, I understand that many, many progressives of all colors do not want to enter into the race debate because they don't want to get into this uh, dynamic where there are accusations of racism and then defense against racism. Nobody wants to have to trot out their list of black and Latino and Asian friends uh, as, as justification for being able to be in the room um, or their white friends, you know, you know, going in the other direction. And we can avoid that. I understand why that's a problem. But, and and that, is a, um, that is a dynamic that emerges from the definition of racism as always being about the individual, always being intentional. Uh, we can avoid that if we change the question around race, change it from who is the racist 
to what is causing racial inequity. So we don't have to be about routing out the racist because all of us have our biases. We have things in our heads. We grow up with them. They're, they've been around for thousands of years, hundreds of years. And uh, uh, we don't have to stay in our heads only if we go about the project of making the world the kind of place we want it to be, a world where we don't have these enormous gaps in income, in housing, in education, a world in which we're together not just in the way we think about each other, but in the actual conditions of our lives. That is the world in which we're going to be able to come together and be a unified country. So if there is something that I would like you to take home from this conference, it is this idea that a racial analysis is key to everything that we're doing here, key to reforming the media, key to building an economy that really works, key to having an inclusive democracy in which every single person gets to have their voice. Um, one of the things that I would ask you to do as part of that project is to drop the language of illegality in the immigration debate. There are tons of other words we can use to, uh, to indicate the choices that people have made without stripping them of their humanity. I'm going to close with this idea. Taylor Branch, who was the biographer of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Taylor Branch uh, wrote an op-ed on one of the anniversaries of King's assassination. And in that op-ed in the New York Times, Branch said that Dr. King thought that race was a part of everything, but not all of anything. And I really agree with that. Race is a part of everything, but of course it's not all of anything. Of course class plays a role. Of course gender is really important. Of course sexuality is going to change somebody's experience of the world. But if we can remember, if all of us can remember that race is a part of everything, then I promise that I will help to lead a movement in which we also are able to recognize that it's not all of anything, of everything, of anything. So we can, <laughs> we can have a racial analysis and we can also be about economic justice and feminism and sexual liberation. There is no reason that we have to split those things apart, split ourselves apart. And if we can remember all of that, then we can transform the media, we can transform the interactions between union-loving white people and pot-roast-buying people of color in grocery stores. And when we do that, we can transform our nation. Thank you so much. If you haven't bought Rinku's book yet, uh, be sure to pick that up on your way out, stir it up. You won't want to miss that. And if you're not subscribing to Color Lines magazine or visiting colorlines.com, uh, you'll be wanting to change that. Sorry about that. No journalist has done a better job illuminating complex media issues for, for the public than our next speaker. Rick Carr is a correspondent for PBS television. He also teaches radio journalism at Columbia University and regularly contributes stories on technology and culture to NPR News. Through 2007 and 2008, he was a correspondent for the weekly PBS public affairs show, Bill Moyers Journal. And he was nominated for an Emmy in 2006 for his excellent documentary, Net at Risk, which made the case that the United States is falling far behind other nations with regard to the speed and power of its internet infrastructure. And he's here today to share some of his newest work looking at the internet around the world. Please welcome Rick Carr. Uh, thanks, Craig. Hang on for a second. I need to get my laptop out here. So, um, yeah, in 2006, I did a documentary called Net at Risk, as Craig just said, that said that we're falling behind. And you know what? It's not getting any better. In fact, if anything, it's getting worse. I've just come back from Europe. And I guess I want to start by saying, if we could go to the, the slides I prepared, please. It, it, the Internet is something that we as Americans should be proud of. Uh, jokes about Al Gore aside, we actually did invent it. And it, 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 it really embodies a lot of what I think of as progressive American values. It's open, it's democratizing, and all of those things. It's the kind of thing that makes you want to shout, USA, except I made it really small there because according to the information technology uh, 
Innovation Foundation, which is an industry-funded think tank. Uh, they used to rank countries around the world in terms of how good the broadband was. When they last did this in 2008, we ranked just behind Luxembourg, who were behind Britain, who were behind Australia, who were behind Canada, who were behind Switzerland, Norway, Iceland, Denmark, Sweden, France, and the Netherlands, and that's not even the top of the chart. Actually, Japan and South Korea ranked ahead of them. The United States ranked 15th in the world. Now, I've been doing this reporting to figure out how we can do better. Let's look at some of these countries that are ranked ahead of us and see what have they been doing. So I've just come back from the Netherlands. And the thing about the Netherlands is that they are relying on a different technology. They're relying on fiber optics. And fiber optics make a huge, huge difference. I went to a house in a town about 100 miles away from Amsterdam. This is a small town in the country. This is a rural area, not very densely populated. And just coming out of one of those glass fibers going into the house, there was a 100 megabit per second connection. And the owner of the house was very proud to show me what he could do with it. He had a plasma screen HDTV in one room, and then he had another one in another room. In his home office, he had a five-person teleconference going, and it was the smoothest teleconference I'd ever seen. He was speaking with other fiber activists, people trying to get more fiber built around the world. At the same time, he was showing off. He was uploading a two gigabyte file <laughs> that was blazing along. And then when I asked him to check how much bandwidth he had left, he said, oh, we've got capacity to spare. When my wife gets home, she can have a teleconference of her own. And if my kids come back from soccer, they can start gaming, no problem. But the thing about fiber isn't what you get from it, it's what you can do with it because fiber is symmetrical. It's the only communication technology that I've ever encountered that allows everyone to be a broadcaster. As great as the work that Petrie and Hannah and the people at Prometheus have done in building out low power FM, fiber is truly the democratizing, the, the sort of the epitome of the democratizing force of the internet because if you get 100 Mbps in, you can put 100 Mbps out. And I've seen some amazing uses of that. For instance, in medicine, I have seen doctors able to diagnose people within minutes of their apparently having had a stroke via HDTV, via a fiber connection, to determine whether or not to administer medicine that could be the difference between paralysis and a normal life. I've seen educators, I've seen aviation educators do high definition connections with student pilots so that it felt like they were in the same flight simulator, in the same cockpit, flying a plane. I've seen it build communities in the Netherlands. I saw it neighborhood groups and churches using fiber optic HDTV connections to allow people in their communities to come to their meetings even if they couldn't be there. I've seen it improve quality of life, especially for seniors, people who don't feel comfortable going out after 7 p.m. For, because they have vision issues or whatever, can sit there, watch television, and basically have an HD image of their best friend right there on a computer. They don't have to leave home if they don't want to. And there's capacity to spare. If you have 100 Mbps in the Netherlands, next year it's probably going to become 200 Mbps, and within five years it's going to be a gigabit per second. That's unparalleled power. And all of this costs about $75 a month. Now, every single country in this list ahead of the United States is trying to do what the Netherlands has done. So I also went to Great Britain, where they've made great strides. According to Ofcom, their equivalent of the FCC, over the past eight years, prices for broadband decreased by 75% while speeds have doubled. That means the average Brit is getting eight times the bang for the quid that they were getting eight years ago. Here's an example of something that fell out of a newspaper I grabbed when I was in London. Virgin broadband, TV broadband and calls just 10 quid a month. That's about $16. Now yes, look at the fine print, that's an introductory offer. It's gonna go up to a whopping 33 bucks when you're off the introductory offer don't like that, you can go to a company called TalkTalk Talk, who offers broadband for £3.49 a month, $6 a month. You can imagine what this has done for penetration of broadband in low-income communities in Britain. Don't like those, you can go to Demon, you pay a little bit more, but you get actual customer service people who are technicians and not just reading a script telling you to unplug your modem. 
that's not convenient enough for you, you can go to your Royal Mail post office and buy broadband from the post office. And if that's not convenient enough for you, you can go to Britain's largest retailer, Tesco, which is also a broadband provider. The reason that all of this has happened, this choice for consumers has led to a great deal of competition. That's led to faster speeds, better customer service, better service across the board. And the reason for it is because British regulators at Ofcom have taken an activist role. They forced British Telecom to allow other companies to use their wires. Right now, what that's done is it's led British consumers to demand more. They're getting all of this broadband service over copper, over British Telecom's copper. But they see the demand and they see the power, they see the explosive growth in broadband penetration in Britain, and now they want to roll out fiber. And so Ofcom is overseeing negotiations right now with, on one side of the table, British Telecom, who own the telephone poles and the underground ducts through which the fiber would run. On the other side of the table are a lot of those companies I talked about. You've got Virgin Media, you've got Talk Talk, you've got Cable and Wireless, which owns Demon, you've got Royal Mail sitting there, you've got Tesco there, and a lot of those companies are represented by um, a trade group with the unfortunate name of Okta the United Kingdom Competitive Telecommunications Association. So here's my point to bring it home, literally. Ukta has a lot of members, and I was flabbergasted when I first looked at the Ukta website. Ukta has two other members that might be familiar to you. These guys and these guys. The two largest wireline carriers in the United States, two companies that are steadfastly opposed to allowing other companies to use their copper wires or fiber optic cables are arguing for more competition in the United Kingdom. <laughs> now, I'm not done with my reporting yet on these pieces. Uh, the pieces will air on PBS in early May and also on the website Engadget. Thank you. Um, and uh, I have really one major question left that I need to ask of these guys, and that is, if competition's good enough for their broadband, what's wrong with it for our broadband? Thanks for listening. All right, thank you, Rick. Uh, we're about to have a, uh, we're very lucky to have a couple of great guests with us today uh, for a panel discussion about social media and social change. And I want to start by welcoming out the moderator for that session, uh, who is the incredible Deanna Zant. She uh, is the author of a great book called Share This that uh, you need to buy as you leave this room today. Uh, and if you do so, I'm sure she'd be happy to sign it for you. Uh, she is an amazing technologist and organizer and wrangler of this uh, maybe a rowdy panel. So uh, we're so glad she's here with us today. Uh, come on up, Deanna. Hey, everybody. How y'all feeling? All right. No, I want to hear it. How y'all feeling? Yes. We are reforming some media here, people. So I'm going to introduce our panel. Uh, we're going to get right to it. Uh, first up, we have Craig Newmark. Craig happens to be the nerd that founded and works as a customer service rep for Craigslist.org and Craig's Connect. Come on out, Craig. <laughs> After Craig, we have uh, Ramya Raghavan. She is the news and politics manager at YouTube, where she oversees political and social change programming. Yay, Ramya. <laughs> Yay. Uh, after Ramya, we have Ben Hu. Ben is the CEO and founder of Cheeseburger, is a former journalist turned dot-com entrepreneur who also has a knack for nailing the zeitgeist and popularizing internet culture. Ben Hu. We also have, because it's a crazy panel, Alexis Ohanian. 
he is the co-founder of reddit.com with Steve Huffman. He runs a Newman's own for nerds, uh, it's called Red Pig, and he led the marketing and PR for Hipmunk, he leads, I'm sorry, the marketing and PR for Hipmunk. He invests in over a dozen startups and serves as the ambassador for the East to Y Combinator. Come on out, Alexis. And bringing it home, a good friend of mine, I'm pleased to uh, introduce to you, Cheryl Conti. She's the co-founder of Fission Strategy. They do uh, social media for nonprofits and foundations. She's also the co-founder of Jack and Jill Politics, which is the number one black political blog in America. Cheryl. can hear me because you're in the front. Oh, there it is. Now I can hear myself. Thanks. Um, so you spent the last few days, I just want to kind of set up uh, what we're going to talk about here. You, you've spent the last few days hearing about all kinds of media madness. You've got your policy people, you've got your culture folks, your reformers, your transformers, your creators, your remixers. Everybody is in this house. And so we're looking now at this powerful union of entrepreneurs from outside the traditional social justice space who have this desire to do good. And sometimes I personally struggle with this notion. More and more, you know, we see businesses engaging in, in what I recently started calling good washing, sort of like, you know, social justice light. And so I wanted to see real examples of social entrepreneurship laying that ground for tectonic political and social change. Um, I mentioned the word political for, the re for a reason, and something that I think um, has been a theme for me all weekend here um, that I share with, with many uh, people here in this community. Um, to me, politics are much more than candidates and elections and ballot initiatives. Politics, to me, are the art and science of negotiating and managing any kind of power relationship. So that can be the laws that govern us, but it can also be the expectations that people have of us based on our gender or our race or our sexuality or all, any part of our identity. So when I talk about doing political work, I'm talking about challenging and radically redefining those relationships. And to me, that's where the true disruptive power of the internet lies. It's not about replicating what we already do offline. You know, you can have people sign petitions, you can get them to email their representatives, you can have them donate to things, and those things are good tools and those are useful sometimes. But what happens when we uh, use these tools to spark spontaneous movements and get stuff done when we are actually changing people's lives on the ground? What the internet, and especially the social technologies that are exploding right now, um, afford us is the ability to tell stories on a scale and with speed that was previously impossible. Storytelling to me is the absolute fundamental building block of any kind of social change. When we tell stories, yeah. yes, thank you. When we tell stories, we empathize with one another and empathy is the opposite of apathy. It is what will take us out of the isolation and the, the fear mongering that has plagued our culture for so long. Thank you. So letting each other know that we are not alone is one of the most powerful cues that humanity can do for itself. And when we participate in these kind of authentic activities online, when we share with one another, we do more than just get the word out about the things that we care about. We reject prescribed identities and we say, this is what it's like to be a person in my shoes. We beat down the doors of the powerful and we demand to be heard in new ways. We find each other either overtly or covertly and we say, you are not alone. So we have this ability through the internet, not just to affect policy change, but to shift our culture, to respect and reflect the values that we bring to the table. This is our moment and this is what I want to share with you on this panel. Craig? Um, I figure right now we're living in what might be a uh, pivotal decade in human history, an inflection point uh, big time, and that's because people, everyone, has uh, access to some form of uh, social media, depending on where you're operating. Uh, yeah. Okay. To repeat, I think, we're, thank you, I think we're, we're living in a pivotal decade. Right now, so many people have access to social media. We have the opportunity from the grassroots up to change things. That's been uh, a lot harder to do in the past. 
I mean, in the past, you had bloggers, let's say like uh, Martin Luther. Took him a couple hundred years to get done what he wanted to do. <laughs> ben Franklin and uh, John Locke, you know, were able to do it in decades. And I mean uh, the John Locke who was the blogger, not the uh, guy on Lost. <laughs> so the deal is that all of us have the opportunity to, uh, to do something and to do something real. I figure uh, I should stand up. I have a uh, bit of a bully pulpit that I don't know what to do with. It's uh, not good for me. I mean, I don't have any personal need for it. I don't have any uh, business need for it. So I figure I'm, uh, I've started my own little site, my way of standing up for people and trying to get the word out better for them. And then I get out of the way. That's this uh, Craig Connects thing. The theme is that I don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> but I would like to see everyone on the planet connected for their own idea of a common good, figuring I'll give it at least uh, 20 years, that's the commitment, as of a month ago, and we'll just uh, see what happens, just keep plugging away, doing, getting better at it and getting better at it. The idea is it has to come from the grassroots. Uh, no one at the top level can tell people uh, what's going to be effective. We have to decide what works for us as individuals and then work together and see what happens. Um, remember, in our own communities, sometimes we're good at preaching to the converted. What I want to do is avoid doing that. I want to uh, get out of the way as necessary, just keeping an eye on things. Remembering also that when sometimes you get a good thing going, there are uh, people out there, scammers or whatever, who will seek to uh, take over your message. Watch out for those. And you know, I uh, get tired of the uh, sound of my own voice, so I'll turn it over back to Diana. Great. Thanks, Craig. Yay. Ramya, you want to give us uh, sure insights? Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah, OK. Um, so I think um, through YouTube and through video, we see two primary ways um, that you know, video is driving social change. One is by providing access to information, and the other one is providing access to conversation which Clay Shirky, I think, said is actually more important than, than access to just information. Um, but on the information piece, I think one of the most recent examples is of the, the Middle East uprisings um, that we saw. And we saw these people who had an innate desire to document what was happening around them and share that story with the world. And in Iran, in Egypt, in Libya, in all these countries, you see mainstream media being shut out and citizens kind of relying on themselves to share their story. And the bet that they're making is that by using social med media, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, to share their story, that um, you're not only going to see what they're putting out that, there, but you're also going to care about it. So one Cairo activist said, we use Facebook to schedule the protests, we use Twitter to coordinate them, and we use YouTube to tell the world about them. And so um, true to that, uh, in, within one month of the Egyptian protests, um, going on, we saw 30,000 uh, videos tagged Egypt. Um, and so how do you kind of source through and find the best and most authentic information um, on CitizenTube, youtube.com slash CitizenTube, we partnered with Storyful, which is a news curation startup. And we are, um, we are actively curating about that around the Japan earthquake, so some of these breaking news events to bring relevant information to folks. Um, one point I would also just make is um, that uh, our goal is to leave up as much footage as possible. So we look, our policy team will huddle on a particular video and if, if um, it meets our EDS requirement, if there's educational, documentary, or scientific content um, associated with it, we'll leave it up. Even if it's graphic, we may just age gate it. Um, the other thing that's important is user intent. So what, did this, what was the reason behind this person uploading it, and was it EDS? Um, so, so that's interesting. Um, a quick point on access to conversation. Um, a great example of this is um, Mark Horvat. He used to be a homeless man living on the streets in LA. He now has a project called Invisible People TV, where he documents the lives of homeless people around the country, has them tell their own stories. Um, Obviously, his videos get thousands of views and, and thousands of comments, and, and a lot of them are not particularly um, fruitful or productive. Um, some of them are, are downright hateful. And one interesting thing that Mark said to me was, Rami, I leave up every single one of those comments, 
because how are you gonna change people's opinions if you don't know what they are, even if they're hateful? So that, that's something that I'd be interested to discuss, you know, the importance around access to conversation and perhaps limiting that or leaving it completely open. Great, thank you, Ramya. Ben. So I'm gonna make it a little bit lighter. Uh, I run a user-generated humor community. Well, actually, I run uh, Cheeseburger Network runs about 50 different sites. Um, I can as Cheeseburger, Fail Blog, Meme Base are some of our most popular ones. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> Woo! Um, and, and what we do is that we let people share their sense of humor. And the types of storytelling that we do is very bite-sized. The amount of information you get from a photo or from a snippet of video is, is usually less than 30 seconds or a minute. And there you go. That's our site. Um, so we have videos and photos and things like that. And so one of the things that we're, we're trying to look at is um, how, do, how do communities form stories? I'm being uh, upstaged by my own site, I can tell. Uh, <laughs> happens quite often. Uh, and so all of that stuff is generated by the community. And so they show up and decide that they wanted to share that sense of humor, they wanted to share their self-expression. Uh, and it's not, for us, it's not about storytelling but it's more about story forming. The idea that we as individuals have access to so much information with so many outlets that we're able to form our own narrative in our own minds, regardless of who is telling the story. And that, um, that me methodology has more to do with the audience's ability to think critically about a subject matter than just sitting there consuming what, something that somebody else has written. And that's something that we feel like needs to happen more on the internet. Instead of just assuming what people tell you is true, think critically about whether what they're telling you is true, what kind of agendas do they have, what motivations do they have, where else can I validate this information? How do we make a more informed and engaged audience instead of just the rhetoric of politics that, that drive up engagement temporarily yet make people disenchanted about the process of politics? And that's a big problem that we run into. You, you look at YouTube and its divergence of opinions, how do you aggregate it so that people can form their own informed opinions when they see the whole picture, not just a story somebody wants to tell? And when we take that to entertainment, you, know, you can actually have people express very different opinions about the same piece of humor, and we want to give them the space to actually you know, uh, basically react to that humor and to show that um, this is me, I take something away from uh, visiting uh, one of these sites every day than somebody else does, and that's okay. Seeing the internet in very different light uh, from others is actually a good thing, that the diversity of opinions that we have is actually great, and it makes the overall discur discourse on the internet better because of it. Awesome, thanks, Ben. <laughs> Alexis. I, I have slides, but I don't know how to activate yes, them. Yes, they're they activated automatically. Can we bring oh. up Alexis' slides, please? It's oh. like an Ignite. Oh, this is going to be interesting. OK, hey, everyone. Yeah, I'm usually involved with a bunch of things with cute animal logos, which is what keeps me employed. Uh, there's a few of them. Uh, hopefully, you guys use Reddit. Reddit was a site that a good buddy of mine, Steve Hoffman, and I started right here, actually, in Somerville back in 2005. That's Steve on the side there. I don't always wear a pirate costume, but it was Halloween. Steve just had a crappier costume. Uh, we started this when we were in college together. Uh, we worked on it. Uh, sort of as an idea while we were there as sort of at UVA in the, the final months before we graduated, but then we came up here to Boston. Yeah, wahoo wah. Uh, and, and joined this thing called Y Combinator, which took a chance on a couple of kids with us, like us, who had no experience whatsoever, and uh, said, all right, go ahead, try to build this front page of the web. And lo and behold, it's actually been working out pretty well. Um, Reddit was launched in 2005. In 2006, we were acquired by Condé Nast. Um, and actually, ever since, the site has continued to grow. Um, it's pretty much a place to go where if you find an interesting link, I've chosen Al Jazeera one, uh, in part because we created a site called WTF CNN, uh, which compared the front page of the worldwide leader in news to the front page of Al Jazeera English. Uh, and needless to say, it's still up. It's depressing, but if you go to WTF CNN, you can see. You find an interesting news link. Let's say you want to share it with the community. It could be a photo of a cat. It could be a video of a cat. Uh, you submit it to Reddit. If people like it, they vote it up. If they don't, they vote it down. What this does is create a rising and falling front page of what is new and interesting online. And uh, you can jump ahead two slides. Yeah, there you go. Uh, you vote on up or down. And this creates an interesting sort of front page of, of always what is new and what is interesting. And what has grown out of this, in part, because we have tried so incredibly hard to do as little work as possible in giving control to our users, we've seen all kinds of wonderful things explode. Nowadays, Reddit isn't just about this front page, it's about communities within Reddit, that we let Redditors, sort of Reddit editors, create themselves. And so now there are thousands of communities, and those thousands of communities have spawned a ton of traffic. You can do that page view to unique 
math yourself and see just how great it is. Um, Redditors spend their days on this site contributing within comments, within submissions, to a variety of communities that none of us who actually work for Reddit created. And that's fascinating. The best content on Reddit now is all stuff made by people I have never met before, and that is so cool. Um, and so we take this a step further, and Reddit, despite all of that growth and despite all of its size, I would argue is one of the smallest communities online. There are communities within communities that have their own memes, that have their own inside jokes, that have their own relationships. And what's wild about this is this breeds a kind of altruism that I've never seen before, but happens on a regular basis. So there's a photo here that I want to show you guys. This is a photo Redditor posted. This is the last photo he had of him with his mother, who not long thereafter died. Um, and he wanted that photo enhanced. Do you see what just happened there? That enhancement job happened within minutes by a handful of anonymous Redditors who saw the photo, saw his plea, and wanted to help him out. They didn't know this guy. I don't know this guy, but they felt a, a bond. They felt an interest in doing something good. This went a step further, though. Uh, Red isn't just about helping to do photoshops. Uh, there's a good story about a well in the Mr. Splashy Pants that the fine folks at TED let me give a talk about, which gives you an idea of how low they're scraping the barrel. Um, <laughs> but, but this was a story of a Greenpeace poll that kind of went awry because people really liked the name Mr. Splashy Pants. But because it got so much buzz on the internet, I mean, who wouldn't want to talk about a whale named that? Uh, the Japanese government actually called off their humpback whaling campaign, and Greenpeace had a success, had a victory. It was, it was only for that year, though, so let's not get too excited. But it was a success, and it was done just because they sort of let go and realized, you know what, the internet's taken control of this thing, and it's much bigger than when we started. Um, but Reddit actually is also willing to, to donate, to give money. And, uh, and one of the first examples happened as the atheism community tried to outgood the Christian community on Reddit <laughs> by donating to a Christian charity, uh, World Vision, I believe. And, uh, and it turns out they got involved. In fact, there was a Muslim community on Reddit, not as large, but they also pitched in as well. And this was sort of a using these silly rivalries to actually do some good in the world collaboratively, which was nice. Um, but then let's go a step further. Maybe, maybe there's a chance for us to help on a much larger scale. Uh, after the Haitian earthquake, we saw a lot of Redditors who were really, really worried about giving their money to the Red Cross because of all the debt the nonprofit has on its books and the fact that $1 donated does not necessarily translate into a dollar given to do good. So we got in touch with a nonprofit called uh, direct relief, which actually gives 100% of your donation to like doing good work. And Reddit got excited. They donated $185,000 to this in the span of just a few weeks because direct relief was willing to send us photos of medical supplies branded with a Reddit alien on a plane in California and then at an airport in Port-au-Prince. They were willing to take a few crappy digital camera photos and connect with a community of people and show that their money was going to something good. But this was something admittedly that I saw one day and thought, let me jump on this. Stephen Colbert gave the Reddit community something that got them so excited, it didn't take an administrator to get the ball moving. Actually, Reddit got excited because Stephen Colbert wanted to do a rally. You may have heard the rally to restore sanity and or fear. Uh, and Reddit really wanted to get Stephen's attention, and they really wanted this to come to fruition. And so the, the Colbert folks are very good about reaching out to the Reddit community. And Reddit realized that he was on the board of Donors Choose. So they said, let's drop a money bomb on Donors Choose. How much money did they end up donating to Donors Choose? Let's hit that next slide and unveil it. Yeah, wow. that's real money from a bunch of random people who come to the site every day to look at everything from cats to breaking world news. And this is part of the magic, and this is part of the thing that really excites me, because Reddit is one of many, many communities online. And I wish they all had Reddit's commenting section, which Steve Huffman, my co-founder, engineered, and I wish more people would copy. It's open source, so please do it. Um, this commenting system is devoid of any Facebook connect. You see not a single real name, not a single real photo. All you're seeing is a username, this kind of pseudo-anonymity, where you could be having a conversation with someone named FluffyBunny26, and it means just as much as when you're having a conversation with your friends over drinks at a bar. And that's cool. That's, that's, that's showing something that happens every day online and that I'd like to see happen more often and for more good things. Thank you. Thanks. All right, Cheryl. All right, well, I think as we can see from my fellow panelists, social media is gaining, not retreating, in importance in outreach and advocacy. And, and folks, clearly, this is no longer a test of the emergency broadcasting system. Okay, the emergency is now, and we are live on the internet. And I think there's a voice here within each one of you who can unlock and, and be as powerful as any one on this panel. When I first launched Jack and Jill Politics, I was just another person in an office after work who was really frustrated by what I was seeing in the media and how African Americans, you know, who are tax paying, ordinary, hardworking citizens were being portrayed. 
uh, as criminals or as Jay-Z and Beyonce, that there was no middle ground <laughs> between, you know, there was no reality of, of who we really are. And, and through my work uh, at Jack and Jill Politics, we've broken a few rules uh, about how bl black people are supposed to act uh, on the internet. We've challenged uh, the assumptions in the media and in politics about who black people are, what we think, what we want, who we consider our leaders to be, and, and how we plan to work together to build a better and more equal America for all. And we actually, I think, have helped to create some new rules um, about how we can all uh, share what we're thinking and doing online. And, and in creating this site, we've attracted a really strong multiracial community, as it turns out. Other people were interested in what real black people had to say as well, as it, as it turns out. Uh, we've created, <laughs> sure, we've created some history. Uh, we've won some awards, both in the tech community, which has been really exciting, uh, and uh, within the uh, black community. We've gotten fan mail from movie stars, which is sweet. Uh, we've, and, and you know, I'm most proud that we've encouraged thousands of, and thousands of other bloggers of many different backgrounds, um, but particularly African Americans, uh, to shed their fear and you know, sh let their authentic voice shine through. And now my work at Fission Strategy, uh, which is a firm that helps nonprofits and uh, foundations to blog better, tweet better, use Facebook and Reddit more effectively, share their cat pictures on the internet and more effectively, use Craigslist and YouTube more effectively. We uh, do it all, is what she We said. do it all. We help nonprofits and foundations to understand, navigate, and transcend the trends and, and help to rebuild uh, our, our, our world. Uh, an example of, of how things are changing is 90% of mothers in America access the internet in some way. And 50%, over 50% of those are blog readers. One of our clients is Moms Rising. They are working for a family-friendly America. And they said, we, well, we've got 140,000 uh, supporters, and, and we feel like we're on the precipice of doing something really big. So we said, that's great, let's do a viral video. Moms like YouTube, just like everybody else. Uh, but in promoting this Mother of the Year Award in which for Mother's Day, people could reward their moms with a customized video with their name on it, which was very fun, used a lot of humor. Uh, we wanted to reach out to all of these amazing and powerful mom bloggers who have created these e exciting places where moms can come together and, and talk about their challenges and their triumphs. And we reached out on Twitter. We went really big in, in finding individual personalities to talk to, to share this story and, and these videos. In so doing, within two weeks, in, in Mother's Day uh, 2009, they went from 140,000 supporters to 1.2 million. Yeah, that's a big number, right? And, and it's not about list building. Ultimately, it's about tool building. It's about movement building. So that very next year, the healthcare reform debate was coming up, and they were able to motivate this new audience who was interested in, in advocacy and outreach around the issues that are important to moms to send over 650,000 different types of contacts to members of Congress in support of healthcare reform, which, as we know, passed. So this is how you can achieve your victory, folks, is through unlocking your own voice, through uniting with other people's voices, through letting the truth of who you are and what you stand for soar out there. All right. Well, we have just a couple of minutes, um, just a couple of minutes left, and, and uh, you know, I've, I've, I've like 8,000 questions for you all, but I'm gonna keep it to two or three, and, um, uh, just to toss, and anybody can answer this. Um, you know, I noticed some themes amongst all of you talking about not wanting to preach to the choir versus finding your choir and connecting to them. Like, in the in the different work that you each do, where do you see the value of of finding your choir and reaching them versus how you do outreach? Where um, and how do you accomplish those those goals? All of all of our most impressive work is done by the hardcore, the passionate ones. And we want to give them as much control and as much power as possible to make great stuff. We just get out of their way. That's why they create Reddits. That's why they do all the stuff they do. 
But one of the terms that really upsets me is slacktivism, uh, because for any idea to become universal, like let's go back, let's talk about the civil rights movement. I think we can all pretty much agree now that that was a good thing, right? Yes. Okay. At some point in that bell curve, let's assume a normal distribution, right? We're all tech people, most of us are tech people. They're the early adopters. They're the, the very small percentage. They're the people who are marching. They're the people who are fighting the fire hoses. They're the ones who are actually passionately going door to door active, being activists. But it didn't actually come to fruition, what, almost a decade after Rosa wouldn't give up her seat until that group of slacktivists in the middle of the bell curve actually said, you know what, this is okay. I, I can't be there to march, but I am actually okay with this. My mind has been changed. And I think an idea has to become mainstream enough and sort of banal enough for people to really accept it and for it to really succeed. And so it's all about absolutely empowering that base, but at a certain point, you want it to get bigger than that small early adopter curve. You want it to become something that's universal and just obvious. You want it to be something where it's like, duh. That's it. Yeah, I, you know, I, I would echo that sentiment about about the uh, the hardcore community, but it's it's all about people's ability to engage with that uh, subject matter and feel a sense of ownership. And I think that's what internet communities are really good at is that sense that I own this problem, and that I'm going to do something about that. And we don't trust our users in, in most communities enough to let them own that problem because we feel that as the you know blogger that we should be driving the issue. But once you allow um, once people feel like they're part of uh, a solution, they start to actually engage in it a little bit more. And it, it is this kind of slow rolling cycle of people getting more and more engaged over an issue because they see it. They start to open their eyes and see that there is a problem where they live or about the issues that they want to connect with. And, and giving them that forum is incredibly important. And giving people the, 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 a protected place, a place where they can feel uh, open about being able to say what they want to say and not be you know, uh, trolled or you know, uh, be, be criticized because of that is really, really important in allowing people to take that first step onto the internet. Because let's face it, even though we're sitting here today, the vast majority of people on the internet do not feel comfortable participating. And we need to help them get over that fear. Yeah. There's this pervasive fallacy that I encounter quite a lot that because it's now easier to participate using the internet, that it's less meaningful. You know, and what I tell my clients is that behind every mouse click, behind every comment is a living, breathing, vital human person who took the time to actually share something of themselves. And you know, I think if you can act in that way, it means that you can move that person potentially from that first action of clicking or you know, sending a fax, you know, using the internet, or making a phone call, or posting a cat video, or talking about Mr. Smashy, Splashy Pants <laughs> and saving whales, to actually going offline, to actually marching in the streets. For one of our clients, Reform Immigration for America, we help them build a bilingual Spanish and English SMS texting network that sends phone calls, among other things, to members of Congress of 160,000 people. That has driven hundreds of thousands of calls to Congress, and it's gotten hundreds of thousands of people around the country to rallies. Behind every text message we know is a person. And I think if you act and, and really believe that and, and speak like that, that is how you tap into power. Great. We've actually just got a couple of minutes. Um, I think, yeah. Uh, uh, quickly, if you had one piece of advice to give everyone about whether that's building community, whether that's um, you know a particular kind of organizing or outreach, what is the each of you? What is the one piece of advice that you would give this this audience to take home with them, an action that they could take? Uh, start with your own passion. If people don't understand why you're passionate and how you're passionate about it, or how much you're passionate about it, they're not going to be engaged. Right? The, the leadership of the internet starts with the random individual blogging anonymously about some topic that they love uh, and they want to discuss. Without that passion, there is no internet. This is a volunteer effort, right? Everybody starts out as a volunteer. Everybody starts out by pitching in their time for free. And without that passion, we can't actually do anything. And so encourage people to be passionate about that subject matter. Encourage people to be passionate and, yet, and rational about it. And that's how I think you win people over. And I think those two things combined can change anything in this world. At the risk of uh, repetition, you don't want to uh, preach to the choir. 
we do want to expand messages uh, beyond that and actually get something done that does mean standing up for the things you believe in like what one might see announcements over the next week or so regarding uh, more support for donors choose regarding well if you want to get uh, people to have a voice they need uh, bandwidth and connectivity we need more of that in the uh, West Bank of Palestine so the idea is to do something real and then uh, see what happens um, I would say when you're thinking about uploading video content when you're when you're planning out your video think about doing something that's gonna make someone feel something I think there's a lack of, of passion as, as Ben said and feeling on the internet at times so for example the It Gets Better project, I think, is a, is a phenomenal example. Um, this is Dan Savage's campaign against LGBT bullying. Fantastic. Because when you watch those videos, it's not just about one video. It's about thousands of videos. When you watch them, you feel something in your gut. When you watch these Middle East uprising videos, you know, you may feel fear. You may feel hope. But, but it makes you feel. So I would say when you're going out there to create content, you know, think about that feeling and that, that you want people to have. Um, mobile, I believe, is the next frontier. Pew Internet actually released a study last year that shows if you count mobile Internet access, there is no digital divide. And in fact, minorities are more likely to use the Internet, period, over uh, white people. Uh, this, is, this is true. Uh, there are forces that understand that and are working to control uh, people's access and abilities, and I think Free Press is doing great work in making sure that the net remains neutral across all of the ways in which people access the internet. Uh, one place that I would uh, encourage you to check out uh, is our um, report on how you can use mobile effectively for advocacy um, and text messaging. It's at smsadvocacy.com. That's smsadvocacy.com. Uh, design like you give a damn, whether it's the websites you're building, actually make them not suck. Um, build stuff that users will want to use uh, and treat them that way. Treat them like adults and you'll find the community will respond really well to that. If you treat people like adults, generally speaking, they behave like them. And if you can really show all of these things we've been talking about, if you can show that passion in everything you do, if it's communicated in everything from the copy on your website to the way your customer service people interact with users, they will realize that the people working behind the scenes here actually give a damn, and they will too. Great. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you all. For those of you who started working on your conference evaluations, you want to flip to the Sunday closing plenary and write down awesome panel. I've got, I've got that, so uh, be sure to do that. Ooh, we're, we're almost done, NCMR. Our, our last speaker here today does not need much of an introduction to this audience. Uh, in fact, I imagine many of you out here, like me, are here because you read something that he wrote. That's how I first became a media reformer. John Nichols is first and foremost a journalist for the nation as well as the Madison Capital Times. He's the author of numerous books and a co-founder of Free Press. He's someone who understands that there's really no such thing as objective journalism, but that that shouldn't be a contradiction between having an opinion and getting at the truth or uncovering the facts. So please, a big, warm NCMR welcome for the one and only John Nichols. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, look at these beautiful people. Oh yeah, better looking every conference, it's amazing. It's amazing, look at you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, I'm gonna do the first thing, the real technological struggle, make sure the microphone is close enough to your mouth so people can hear you. Whoa, Josh Silver. It is a name that ought to inspire applause just in and of itself. Let me tell you something. A lot of people come up to Bob McChesney and myself and they say, 
wow, thanks, thanks so much for, you know, coming up with these ideas and doing all that. And it's true. Bob and I had a lot of ideas. And we got them from one side of the living room to the other. Sometimes we got them from one side of town to the other. But when Josh Silver called us, he got those ideas from one side of America to the other. An incredible organizer and a builder of a movement, Josh Silver. And in our great religious traditions, we speak of going from strength to strength. And let me tell you something. I am so very honored to be associated with an organization that will still be guided in so many ways by Josh Silver, but that will be led now by my former editor at In These Times, Craig Aaron. Craig Aaron an incredibly brilliant, capable journalist and a great leader. I'm so proud of it. Now, I got to tell you also, I know you heard from her before, but Kim Gandy, the new president of the Free Press Board, has just taken charge of things and proved to be an incredibly wonderful player. And I want to emphasize, the Free Press Board and the Free Press staff, these are incredible players. We are so lucky to have all these people with us in this struggle. They make it happen. They really do make it happen. So I've been a little busy the last six, eight weeks. Um, out in my home state of Wisconsin. And I have to tell you something. I, uh, I read my New York Times every day. And after, after the governor of Wisconsin and his legislative allies pushed through their anti-labor bill, a bill that took away collective bargaining rights and restructured most of the organization of our state in a way that consolidated power upward into an executive, took it away from local democracy, took it away from our school boards. Terrible thing we've all been struggling against out in Wisconsin. I read my New York Times on that Friday morning, and it said on that front page, it said, the struggle in Wisconsin is over. The struggle is done. They lost. Go home. And then, the next morning, my daughter Whitman and I went down to the south side of Madison, outside of town, a little bit rural area, and we met up with my friend Joel Greeno, who is a farmer from Kendall, Wisconsin. And Joel had put out a call to farmers to ride their tractors into Madison. And out in that parking lot, there were more than 50 tractors, big tractors, small tractors. Tractors that barely moved, let me tell you. <laughs> One guy had done his chores at 3 a.m. and had driven more than 50 miles on a tractor that didn't go very fast. And we were all out there on that bitter cold morning. And Joel said, come on, let's roll. And my daughter and I got back on the back of a truck. We fought, went up with these farmers, and it was slow. Farm tractors don't move that fast. We came edging up around the corner, and there were about four little kids out there with a sign that they'd made, these elementary school kids that said, thank you, farmers. And as we went up through it toward town, there was maybe 20 people here, thank you, farmers, and 50 people there, thank you, farmers, and then 100, and cars started slowing down. They had all learned how to honk their horn to the this is what democracy looks like slogan. Beep, 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 beep. Coming along the side, slowing down, protecting these tractors as they slowly edged toward downtown Madison. And we rounded the corner, and we came up that hill toward the capital of our state. And as we entered the great square of Madison, we were greeted by 150,000 Wisconsinites who did not read the New York Times. They did not know their struggle was over. And I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. That was the moment at which I realized the most powerful lesson of the Wisconsin experience, and that is the numbers matter. Get them with the numbers. It's what Gandhi said. And the truth is that it's something that a lot of us forgot. We sometimes thought you could do this by hiring some great lobbyists, maybe doing some good PR, some good spin. And you know what? 
Maybe it works for the big guys, for big media, for big power, for very big corporations. But I want to tell you something. It doesn't work for our side. The thing that works for our side is great masses of people who are willing to go into the streets and demand the full promise of democracy. Not a half promise, the full promise of democracy. And let me tell you something. When you connect those numbers with Twitter and Facebook, really incredible things can happen. We are now more than eight weeks, better part of eight weeks, into this struggle in Wisconsin, this great struggle that's been going on. And an American governor with control of both chambers of the state legislature has not implemented his plan solely because hundreds of thousands of people got out and said, no, no, no. Now, I want to tell you what, was, what has been accomplished in Wisconsin, because it relates so much to everything that people are doing here. When I went back to my hometown of Union Grove, population, no, come on, there's more than 12. <laughs> We've been booming. Union Grove's up to almost 3,000. But it, when I was there, it was a lot smaller. And, and so I went back to my hometown, and, and they had the first ever labor rally in Union Grove, the first ever labor march in Union Grove. Uh, because they're threatened to close down uh, some, some facilities there for, for girls that, that either have some mental disability or some, some troubles in their lives. There's a couple of them there. And, and as we were walking in that march, I was walking with a woman who had come out from Racine, Wisconsin. She works out there. And I said, well, what do you do? That's what you do when you're on a long march with a bunch of workers. Uh, and, and I said, what do you do? And she said, well, I, I come out at, at midnight and I sleep in a, uh, in a room with six mentally disabled girls every night uh, because it's very tough for them. They'll wake up in the middle of the night and they won't know where they are. They'll be scared, they'll scream. They need somebody there to take care of them. And I, I listened to this and I said, wow, that, that's gotta be pretty tough work. You know, what do they pay you for that? She says, oh, 14, 15 bucks an hour. And I said, well, that's, you know, that's not so, it's not great pay, but it, it gets you through. And she says, yeah, but I got some good health benefits, and I got to, you know, if I work at it for 40 years, I can get a little pension. And, and, and she said, but that's not why I do it. I do it because in the morning, the parents call and say, how, how did my kid do? Because these moms and dads, they love their children. They love them as much as I love my kids, but they can't, they can't do it. They can't raise their other kids. They can't do their work and take care of a child with so many challenges at home. And so they give that child up to the state. They say to the state, will you take care of my baby? And when that phone call comes in the morning, I stay around for a half hour after I'm done with my shift, and I talk to the parents, and I say, it's OK. Your baby was with me last night. I took care of your baby, and she's just fine. That's what this struggle is all about. It's about the forgotten people in this society who go out and make sure that we are a humane and functional country where those women can make their 14 or 15 bucks an hour, get a little bit of benefit and a little bit of pension, and the joy, the absolute joy of being able to serve others. That's what all of these struggles are about. And frankly, that's what the struggles of free press have to be about in the weeks, years, and months to come. We cannot just be about gigabytes, about issues that matter a lot to me, like net neutrality. We have to be about telling the human stories of the forgotten Americans who are being beaten on by those who want to balance a budget on the backs of our hardest workers. You know, Free Press was founded as a grassroots movement. And the weird thing is we were blindsided by success. Uh, Bob and I always thought that we would go out and spend years, you know, going neighborhood to neighborhood, town to town, getting people engaged with these issues. And then George W. Bush decided, right after he started the war in Iraq, that he was going to do newspaper cross-ownership, media consolidation, and all these other things. And suddenly, Common Cause, MoveOn.org, all these groups came together and they said, 
look, we've got to stop that. We've got to do something about that. And we beat the Bush agenda on media in 2003 at the height of his power because people came together and said, let's do it. Free Press scored an incredible victory right at the start. And so then we thought, oh, wow, this, is, you know, this just isn't that hard. <laughs> wow, you know? So then we went out and we put net neutrality on the table, something nobody even understood what it meant. And year after year, we beat back their agenda as hard as it was. We stopped the, some of the most powerful players in telecommunications from getting what they wanted because we had these incredible movements to save the Internet Coalition. It worked. And then we got on board with our good friends from the Prometheus Radio Project, and we actually won low-power FM radio in this country. <laughs> Incredible victories. Incredible victories. And, you know, we worked and worked with all these groups, and then we thought, well, you know what? I tell you, it's going to be awful easy once we elect a president, once we elect a Congress. You know, now it's all just going to come together, and that's just going to, you know, we're going to sail right through this thing. And you know what? Some people, you know, it's important to do the work in Washington. There's no doubt of that. And there's still victories to be won in the city of Washington. But I, we were reminded, I think especially right now, of that wonderful lesson that came when A. Philip Randolph, the great civil rights leader, went and met with Franklin Roosevelt. Back in the early 1940s, Randolph was trying to integrate the defense industries. And he said, President Roosevelt, you know this is the right thing to do. And President Roosevelt said, yes, I, I do know it's the right thing to do. And he says, President Roosevelt, will you do it? President Roosevelt said, go out and make me do it. Go out and organize and build a movement that makes it impossible for me not to do this, and I'll do it. That has always been the reality. Even when you have a president that you respect, even when you have a president that you may love, the bottom line is, it is the mass movements, it is the people-powered movements that make those presidents and those Congresses act. And our lesson today must be, it must be, yes, you are right to applaud that. That is the absolute truth. But let me tell you this, let me tell you this critical thing. Now is the time for us to pivot. Now is the time for us to take a deep breath and look around at reality. The reality is, the reality is, that there are great masses of people out there waiting to be organized to fight for economic and social justice, for a media that treats us all fairly, and for a real democracy in this country. And free press's role in the weeks and years and months to come must be to reconnect with our grassroots struggle. And we have to go out to the people who have built this movement from the start our media justice campaigners, our media activists, our media reformers, our community media folks, our indie media creators. We have to go back to the communities that built this struggle. We have to go back to the unions that represent media workers. We have to go back to the churches and the mosques and the synagogues where we began to build out this understanding that media reform is not a technical issue, it is a moral issue. It is a justice issue. We need to go back and reconnect with those underpinnings of this movement. And let me tell you why we're going to do it. We are going to do it because we do want a better journalism in this country. The fact of the matter is that newspapers of record should not tell great movements that their struggles are over simply because a powerful person gamed the system. That's not how it's supposed to be. But also we will do it because we have work to do with our conservative friends. We need to go out to people who think of themselves as conservatives and we need to say to them, look, you don't want your lives controlled by big government but you shouldn't want your lives controlled by big media either. We need to build a broad movement that says, we need to build a broad movement that says, when we come together, we can create a journalism that represents all of our voices. And when we create a better journalism in this country, when we create a better communications in this country, then and only then will we realize the promise 
contained in that First Amendment of the Constitution, the promise of a free press. There is not a free press until every voice is heard, until we have a real dialogue and a real debate in this country. And there is not a democracy until we have that free press. So we are about to go out, we are about to go out and fight as renewed activists, a new and engaged grassroots struggle that focuses on building a movement strong enough to tell any president and any Congress that the next America, the America that we are building, will be an America where that woman I walked with in Union Grove, Wisconsin, that woman who sleeps through the night with those disabled girls, that woman's voice will be as much a part of our dialogue as the voice of John Boehner or Mitch McConnell or Barack Obama. We build a movement for her. We build a movement for journalism. We build a movement for media reform. We build a movement for democracy. We are going to do as Martin Luther King Jr. suggested. We are going to bend the arc of history toward justice. And when we bend it, we will realize the American promise for that woman, for all of us, for all Americans, because it rests with us to make real the promise of the American experiment. It rests with us to build a free press. It rests with us to build a democracy. And we are going to go out and make them do it. Thank you. Thank you, free press. Thank you to all of you for your activism, for your passion, for building this movement. You are the grassroots. You are going to win this fight. We are going to reclaim our media, and we are going to make a democracy with you, with all of us. Solidarity. Thank you, John Nichols. Thank you, John. So uh, I was leaving the plenary last night, and I got into the elevator at the hotel, and uh, you know we're all kind of staring, trying to read each other's name tags. And somebody turned to me, and she said, you're gonna follow up, right? <laughs> I, I thought that was a fair question. And so uh, I told her what I'll tell you, which is uh, uh, we promise to follow up if you keep showing up and I uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks for coming out. Bye-bye.